At the end of part six of my series, I showed you an interview with Egyptian native Mustafa A. Hefni, who is a black man living in the U.S. who is still fighting for his natural born right to be classified as a black man in the United States. He is literally being forced to legally refer to himself as white or Caucasian, or at least they thought they could force him into denying his blackness. Because this brother holds a PhD in education and he's actually lost his job as a teacher because he refused to refer to himself as Caucasian. And he's been fighting against white supremacy for over 20 years now, fighting for just the right to call himself black. Since then, he's filed two lawsuits, which has caused him to lose his house, his car, and his professional career, which he's earned as a black man and he's been forced to file for bankruptcy and since his initial news interview um, in the 90s I believe uh, was yeah in the 90s he's been fired five times by different employees and forced to quit a sixth job now in 2012 he sent a letter to President Obama pleading for support just to be acknowledged as a black man reminding Obama that both of his parents are black and that his skin is darker. Now you can go to his Facebook page, Mustafa Hefni, to read his letter to the president, but let me read to you the letter in which he was initially given to him from his employer back in 1987. Now this was a letter warning him of termination. Dear Mr. Hefni, be advised that the Michigan Department of Education collects racial and ethnic data as prescribed in Directive Number 15, Race and Ethnic Standards for Federal Statistics and Administrative Reporting. This directive provides standard classification for record keeping, collection, and presentations of data on race and ethnicity in federal program administrative reporting and statistical activities. According to this directive, a white person is a person having origins in any of the original peoples of Europe, North Africa, or the Middle East. Since you come from Egypt, a North African and Middle Eastern country, you are white, not black. You are directed to change your classification on the race ethnic identification card. Be advised that failure to do so will have serious repercussions for your career and will constitute insubordination, which may result in suspension and discharge. This is from Human Resources. Evidence indicated the people of Heliopolis were not Caucasian. Fifty human skeletons were found in excavations in Heliopolis. All of the skulls found had a prognathism, which is generally reckoned as an Africoid feature. The earliest remains of Negroids are found in Sudan on the Egyptian Sudanese border at Jebel Sahaba in Tushka. This brings enlightenment to the fact that the people whom which we label as Negroids did not originate in Sub-Saharan Africa. This also destroys those who apply geopolitical terms to designate phenotype. The crania associated with Tushka in Upper Egypt were described as having sub-Saharan affinities and even more Negroid than Dogon of Mali, who were described as being intermediates. Another line of evidence showing a relationship between ancient Egyptians and populations from tropical Africa concerns the skeleton beyond the skull, specifically the proportion of the limbs. A 2003 paper appeared in the American Journal of Physical Anthropology by Dr. Sonia Zakrzewski entitled Variation in Ancient Egyptian Stature and Body Proportions, where she confirmed the results of previous studies indicating that the ancient Egyptians had tropically adapted body plans. The raw values in Table 6 suggest that Egyptians had the super-Negroid body plan described by Robbins. 
The values for the brachial and crural indices show that the distal segments of each limb are longer relative to the proximal segments than in many African populations. For brachial indices, all Northeast African groups, male and female, have significantly longer radii relative to their humeri compared to Northern and Southern Europeans. This is expected since the resulting greater surface area related to longer limbs allows greater release of heat, which is advantageous in the warm tropical climate of Africa. All male groups from Northeast African region also have significantly smaller brachial indices compared to West African groups. It can be noted that none of the Northeast African groups are significantly different from any other African groups. Therefore, West Africans of both sexes appear to possess the longest distal bones relative to the proximal for the upper limb. Ancient Egyptians and Nubians thus possess generally tropically adapted upper limb proportions with their brachial indices grouping with the majority of other African groups. They are still tropical, just not the most tropical. That is left for West Africans. The Egyptians had tropical body plans, meaning that their skeletal type indicates adaptation to a tropical environment. And note, Egypt is not in the tropics, so take this info as you will. But I will say that the closest tropical habitat to Egypt is Sub-Saharan Africa. Tropical African populations have proportionately longer limbs in European or Asian populations because longer limbs dissipate heat more easily. Measurements of ancient Egyptian skeletons have shown that their limb proportions were within the range of tropical African populations. And sometimes their limbs were proportionately longer than those of some tropical Africans, leading Robinson shoot to call them super negroid. This is especially significant because even though we think of Egypt as a hot place, it is not truly tropical. It cools off during nighttime and winter. Populations living in subtropical desert climates similar to those of Egypt, such as the sand of southwestern Africa, normally have limb proportions intermediate to those of European and tropical populations. If the ancient Egyptians' limb proportions were like those of tropical Africans rather than subtropical people like the sand, that implies that their ancestors must have been relatively recent migrants to subtropical Egypt from a truly tropical area such as tropical sub-Saharan Africa. Also know that the narrower noses that you see on North Africans also has to do with the drier, less humid climate. The climate in Egypt, for instance, is rather dry. It's hot, but it's dry unlike in sub-Saharan Africa where it's more tropical. Examine the areas of Africa where it's sandier versus the greener areas and consider the populations of these areas and their common physical features. Now, although it's hot in Egypt, it's very arid and drier than it is in sub-Saharan West Africa. Like, a nose like mine is better made for moister, more hot and humid region. Whereas if we're talking about a hot and dry region, Understand that an important function of the nose is to warm and moisten inspired air. When air is exhaled, some heat and moisture are lost to the surroundings. The longer the nasal passage, the more efficient the nose is for warming and moistening incoming air, and also the less heat and moisture are lost in exhalation. A narrow, high nose gives a longer nasal passage than a low, broad nose. Therefore, in cold or dry conditions, a high narrow nose is preferable for warming and moistening air before it reaches the lungs and for reducing loss of heat and moisture in expired air. In hot, humid conditions, a low broad nose serves to dissipate heat. The pattern of variation in nasal index corresponds very broadly to that expected if nasal form is indeed an adaptation to regional climate. The highest nasal index values, representing broad low noses, tend to be those of populations in humid tropical regions of Africa and Southeast Asia. Populations with low mean nasal indices, high narrow noses, tend to be found in the cold northern latitudes and also in arid regions such as the desert areas of East Africa and the Arabian Peninsula. So the narrower noses 
it's not about them being mixed with Caucasoid. Um, it's more about them living in drier, more arid parts of Africa. But although their noses are narrow, perhaps the most narrow noses on the planet, their bridges aren't as long or as protruding as the Europeans. And perhaps this is because they don't need such long protruding bridges to warm the air, being that they already live in a hot climate. But a narrower nose and, and smaller nostrils, that can help with the moisture. And parts of the Horn of Africa share the same climate as Egypt, although I don't believe that Egypt was always desert. I believe that this also has to do with Bible prophecy, being that I'm a Bible believer, but that's something that I'll go into later in another video, perhaps. <laughs> now, whites love to show you images of the mummy of Pharaoh Ramses II and making the claim that the ancient Egyptians, or at least the royal ancient Egyptians, were Caucasoid. They point out the hair on the mummy, which I will get into later, as well as his nose, which is not considered a Negroid nose, but more of a Caucasoid nose. Well, even if Ramsey's nose was not as flat or as wide as the so-called super Negroid nose, what they don't tell you is that the embalmers of Ramsey's corpse stuffed his nose with peppercorns to keep the nose from collapsing and to keep it from totally getting flattened by the bandages. This does not say that this was Ramsey's original nasal shape. You see that hook in the noses of quite a few of the mummies, although you hardly see those hook noses on any of them in the paintings, sculptures, etc. That hook that you see on the noses of many of the mummies are also the result of the embalmers using special hooks to pull out the brains of the corpses. During the mummification process, organs were removed and the brain was usually discarded of. And they would do this by inserting a hook through the nasal passage and pulling out the brains. Disgusting, I know. But this would result in the nose having that bump or hook look that you see on many of the mummies. And as I said, Ramsey's nose was stuffed with peppercorns, which stretched it out even more. They're claiming that this is how his nose must have originally looked before death, yet you don't see that in any paintings, busts, carvings, or statues of him. And they overlook his rounded forehead, which is common to blacks of North Africa. The x-ray says that he had rounded forehead. Now, I can understand one questioning the racial background of the Egyptian official Yuya, father of Queen T, King Tut's grandmother, but that's only because of his facial structure overall and his height. He was said to be unusually tall for an Egyptian. Still, however, you should know that within the African population, within the black African population, you're going to find the most diversity. You're going to find dolichocephalic heads, mesocephalic heads, and brachycephalic heads. You're going to find the widest noses and the narrowest noses. You're going to find the shortest people and you're going to find the tallest people. In fact, do you know what the warring in Rwanda really stemmed from? European colonists, convinced the Tutsi had migrated to Rwanda from Ethiopia, believed the Tutsi were more Caucasian than the Hutu and were therefore racially superior and better suited to carry out colonial administrative tasks. And this pitted tribe against tribe. Sounds familiar, I know. But know that the black man is the original man, and all physical features derive from the original man. Caucasians don't show the widest variation in all traits, just in certain superficial ones, such as hair color and eye color. When it comes to something like height, Caucasians, they lose out to Africans whose average stature range from 4'8 for adult male pygmies to 5'10 for adult male Tutsis. Similarly, other races show greater variation in nose configuration, distribution of body fat, and so on. And as I was taught by my white professors in anthropology class, those who are put in the racial category of black possess more dominant traits. You can get blue eyes from brown eyes, but you cannot get brown eyes from blue eyes. And you can get white skin from black skin, but you cannot get black skin from white skin. 
black is basically a combination of all the colors of the spectrum. Black is pretty much the hue you're going to come up with if you mix paints of various hues. So it's ridiculous to even try to box a brother into some particular type, super or ordinary. We cannot talk about the ancient Egyptians' biological relations to other groups of African people if we are still stuck on that idea that Africans universally have a specific set of physical features or negroid features like flat wide noses and thick lips. Although many African populations do possess these features, a great many do not. And this is even the case with the indigenous African populations. Physical anthropologist Jean Hironox writes, in Sub-Saharan Africa, many anthropological characters show a wide range of population means or frequencies. In some of them, the whole world range is covered in the subcontinent. Here live the shortest and the tallest human populations, the one with the highest and the one with the lowest nose, the one with the thickest and the one with the thinnest lips in the world. In this area, the range of the average nose widths covers 92% of the world range. Only a narrow range of extremely low means are absent from the African record. Means for head diameters cover about 80% of the world range. It is expected that black people, who are said to be the original people, would give you the most diversity. And in considering all the data acquired on the ancient Egyptian skeletons, scientifically, they were what we would simply call black without hesitation. As simple as it sounds, they had Nilotic or Ethiopian, Ugandan, Sudanese, Egyptian, now related beliefs, burial customs, and linguistics that were Nilo-Saharan, and cultural mannerisms consistent with being Nilotic. In America, because of the sub-Saharan slave trade, we are surrounded by sub-Saharan blacks with sporadic admixture. We simply call them black though. A critical point to understand when studying the racial makeup of Nile Valley populations is that the full diversity of Afropoid variants was not often appreciated by the early anthropologists. What anthropologists called the Negro identified only one form of Afropoid variant common to the forest zone of West Africa. This variant became familiar to the European as the type primarily involved in the slave trade. Now remember, the noun Negro or Negroid had became synonymous with slave and all that is gloomy, and it was now used just as the adjective black. So when whites like Matilda say Egyptians may have been black, but they were not Negro, see, they're on some racist tip hoping that you don't get it. They are saying that the Egyptians may have been black, but they weren't slaves. And obviously they still see you, whom they refer to as Negro, as slaves. Cause no, whenever you mention the fact that most of those from the San Bushman tribe or the Khoisan tribe, when you mention that they lack facial prognathism, which is a Negroid trait supposedly, they say that the San Bushman is not a Negro. Now, would you say that these coily haired Africans are not a part of the African or black family? Of course not. So they're basically saying that Negro equals slave. If you are not a slave or were not a descendant of an African slave, you are not a Negro. And if Negro, the adjective used by the Portuguese and Spaniards just meant black, Negro or Negro, then how are these people not black? Or how are they black but not Negro if Negro just means black, right? That doesn't make sense. No, these North Africans are not West Africans, just as the San Bushmen are not Angolans but they are part of the African or black family. They did not derive from the Caucasus mountains or anywhere near Europe as the word Caucasian initially referred to. So why are these Northern Africans being referred to as Caucasian? 
Now, once again, as said earlier, what anthropologists call the Negro identified only one form of Afroquoid variant come into the forest zone of West Africa, although they have greatly expanded the definition of Caucasian. This one form of Afroquoid variant of West Africa, supposedly, became familiar to the European as the type primarily involved in the slave trade and the ancestral group to blacks in the American diaspora. Because of the extreme racial prejudice that grew against this group and its role as the primary source of labor in the U.S. and European colonies, there was a conscientious effort to minimize the influence of this variant or variants with close affinities in now valley populations. Other Afroquoid variants are important to our discussion of now valley populations because their range of distribution overlaps or is in close vicinity with the Nile Valley. Their physical traits were likely present in ancient Egyptian populations, however. 